Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is functions uh, inside of contracts. And so what I have is a same, the same copy of the contract, uh, though I snuck in uh, one change, uh, which is that I added what's called a constructor. Uh, so a constructor is a function uh, that has the same name as the contract itself. So the contract is called simple storage. Uh, there's a function that has the same name, simple storage. And uh, the convention is that this is a function you'll run when you deploy this for the very first time. Okay, so I'm going to write this code. So I'll write the code uh, using whatever I want, a notepad or a, a developer tool or something for Solidity. Okay, then I'm going to have to compile it to EVM code. And I'll show you um, that Ethereum has a, actually a built-in uh, compiler uh, into it as well. So you can, uh, if you want to use the Ethereum wallet, that's one option for, for playing around with these smart contracts. And so you can copy and paste Solidity code into it and it will compile it for you. Or uh, whatever development uh, tool you're using can also do this compile uh, feature for you, okay? Um, so you'll compile it to EVM code and then you'll uh, basically you're going to broadcast it. So it's a brand new contract. So uh, what you're going to do is you're going to um, do a transaction, uh, which is uh, basically to deploy a new contract. Okay, now the term contract uh, here, uh, that implies like, well, it, it sort of gives you a certain mental model of what these things are supposed to do. Uh, they were traditionally called smart contracts uh, because it was thought that these would be kind of like legal contracts that would, would do some legal deployment. We'll talk about this a little later when we talk about use cases in the third part of this of this course, but uh, contract is, is a bit misleading. What this really is is an application. Uh, and if you want to think in terms of object-oriented programming, this is an object uh, within an application. And so it's not, Ethereum's not designed for contracts per se, although that's one use case uh, for it. It's really for any kind of application that you want uh, that sort of run in a decentralized way. Okay, um, so anyway, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll broadcast this. Uh, and so what will happen is this, um, we'll, we'll form an actual transaction that includes the, the, the uh, assembly code for this contract. We'll send it to the network. Uh, one of the miners will take it uh, they'll assign it an address. Okay, uh, they'll put the EVM code on the blockchain. Okay, and uh, so this is a miner. Uh, and then what they'll do is if there's a constructor, they're going to run it. Okay, uh, they'll also create, so you have a bunch of variables here. So we have stored data. So what they'll do is they'll create a, a kind of holder uh, for stored for stored data or whatever state variables you have. Okay, and then what they'll do is they'll uh, they'll actually run the constructor itself, and uh, in the constructor you'll see that um, a variable is passed in. Who who set aside the, the question of who passes this in for a second? But a variable is passed in a uint. So like say thirty five is passed in, then stored data will equal thirty five. Okay, so what the miner is going to do is they're going to create an address, or the address is actually like a hash of things. It's not like they're they're creating it arbitrarily, but anyways, a, a address will be uh, assigned to the contract. The code will be deployed. There'll be containers made for all of your variables, uh, and then they'll actually do the the running of the contract. Um, so they'll they'll execute the constructor. And then the result of that, in this case, would be, for example, that 35 is written into uh, this data. So you have stored data, it's a uint, and now 35 is the value that's stored there. Okay, uh, so that's what happens at the end of the day. Now, where did this 35 come from? Well, the person who does the transaction, uh, who deploys it, when you, when you say, hey, I have this new contract, uh, what you have to do is at that point, uh, you deploy the new contract and you also specify any parameters uh, 
that will be passed into the constructor in particular. Okay, uh, so the person who creates this contract uh, will will specify the parameter. They'll push that with the parameter out to the to the Ethereum network. Uh, a miner uh, is going to take it off of the network, put it in a block, solve that block, uh, and then your contract will now have an address. It will have its source code on the blockchain in compiled form, and it will have all of the variables, okay? And then over time, what's going to happen is people are going to run functions, okay? So when you run a function, uh, what will happen is, first off, I, I want to note that anyone can run a function, okay? will show how you can restrict the actual code that's being run, how the function itself can figure out who's running it and then decide whether that person should be able to do certain tasks or not. But everyone can at least make a call to the function itself. And it, if the function doesn't want a particular person to run it, the function itself has to specify that, okay? Uh, so functions can be run by anyone. Okay, and they can take parameters. So we have a function called set. It takes a parameter x. So Alice comes along and she says, I want to run set x. Uh, and so what she'll do is she'll figure out where is the address of this contract? What address is it stored at? And uh, so when she runs a function, she has to specify the address of the contract that she wants the function run. And then she'll say the actual function that she wants run, and then she'll supply whatever parameters are required for the function, okay? Uh, and uh, we're thinking in terms of users doing this action. It doesn't have to be users, it can be other contracts. So uh, a contract at one address can call a function of a contract at a different address, okay? Uh, so anyone means uh, users or contracts. And uh, the person that's running it, they do have to have an account, okay? So they have to have an address themselves. So uh, anyone, um, if it's a user, it's not like Alice is running it, it's she's running it from her specific address, okay? So functions can be run from everyone. They take parameters. Uh, you have the address of the contract and the transaction uh, to run the function which is called message, or in Solidity, you can access that function uh, by, by, with a variable message. Um, so the transaction to run the function uh, originates from an address. So if you see a contract and you want to run it, run a function on that contract, you have to start with an address uh, and then you're going to run the function from that address. And if you have more than one address, then your client will, will say, okay, which address do you want to run this function from? Okay. Now, why do you need an address? Why can't just someone come along without an address and run it? Because you have to pay for it. So to run a function, it's going to cost gas, which is ether. And so that money has to come from somewhere. And so that money is going to come from an address. Okay. So users will have an address that holds some ether uh, and they'll, they'll stake some of that ether to run this particular function from that address, okay? So at the end of running this function, it's going to consume some of the ether that's in this address. They'll have less ether less left because they ran that function. Now, I also noted that uh, contracts can call other contracts. And so a very natural question is, well, who's paying for that, right? If, if, I, if I pay to run contract A and contract A makes a call to contract B, right? Who's, who's paying uh, the gas costs of running the function on contract B? And so the way Ethereum works is it's the original person. So if you call a contract that calls a, another contract, uh, you're paying for the whole thing. Uh, so the reason for this is, is you can think of, if, if you call a contract that calls another contract, it's like it, you go over to that contract, you take its code and copy and paste it into your own contract. And so you're really paying to, to run a larger function within your own contract. That's the mental model that 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 uh, will will help you.
understand it. Um, the other thing is that contracts can hold ether. Okay, so it is possible that you have a contract that holds ether, and we'll talk. Actually, we'll talk about how you um, how you make that happen. Uh, and first off, Ethereum handles it for you, so you don't have to write code to hold your ether. It's just any contract uh, you can. Uh, send ether to it. You you do need a few restrictions, but um, uh, contracts can hold ether, and then Ethereum itself just keeps track of how much money's uh, a, a given contract address holds. Okay, so this address here is is for a contract, and it can have a balance of ether. Okay, and how does how do you move ether onto it? Well, what you do is you you staple it to a call to the function. Okay, so when you call a function, you can also pass ether along with that function call, and then that ether moves into the contract. Now, the person who writes the contract can say whether a given function will accept ether or not. Okay, and so in this case, none of these functions, uh, except for the last one. Uh, accept it. So the, the way you say that a function is going to accept payment is you add this keyword payable uh, to it. Okay, And uh, that also reminds me that actually there were two additions. So uh, in the last lecture we just saw the set and the get and the um, instance variable. Uh, now we have a constructor so that was the one new addition to this contract. The other new addition is, is this thing at the end. And this is like kind of a really not a big deal uh, but it ends up being a really big deal for, for complicated reasons that we're not going to get to for a couple lectures. Um, so this is a function that has no name. It's a nameless function. Uh, it's called the default function or the fallback function. And what it allows you to do is, let's say someone comes along and they say, I want to run address.function. And so the miner goes over, finds the contract that's sitting at that address, and they're like, hey, there's no function with that name, right? I don't see uh, a function called get and set, right? I, I have a get, I have a set, I don't have a function called get and set. So if it can't find a function that matches uh, the function name, then what it will do is it will, if, it, if it's in the contract, if there's this fallback function, it will just run this one, okay? So it will go through the contract. Uh, if it doesn't find it, then it will run the fallback function. Okay, so maybe the fallback function, I don't know, returns an error or something like that. Uh, so you can um, do it different ways. So this is just an empty fallback function. It doesn't do anything. Um, and we'll talk about, first off, why it's empty, because uh, there, there actually is a pretty good reason. And a few things that go wrong uh, with these fallback functions, not the fault of the fallback functions, but they're used uh, for a very specific task that we'll get to that, that is very problematic and has caused problems for Ethereum. Uh, it's called re-entry uh, and, and uh, it's something you may have heard of. But anyways, we'll, we'll circle back to that. Okay, so back to functions. So functions can be run by anyone. They can take a parameter. They can take payments. Um, uh, they are run against a contract which is sitting uh, at a particular address. Um, there's a few other features of functions that I, I sort of ran out of room for, so I'll put them over here. Functions are run atomically. What does that mean? It means that when a miner takes a function, um, uh, so, so they see a transaction that says go run this function, what they'll do is they'll put that in a block, okay? And uh, what they'll do is they'll, they'll say, okay, I'm now going to run this function. They'll run it to completion. They'll update whatever variables that need to be updated, and then they'll output it, and then they'll move on to some other function that's being run. You know, someone else who asked for a function to be run in some other contract on the Ethereum system. So on Ethereum, just like in Bitcoin, you have a bunch of transactions that are happening all the time. In Ethereum, there's a bunch of function calls that are being called all the time. And so the miners just look through all the different functions that different people want run on different contracts. They pick one, maybe the one that's offering them the most gas. Uh, they run it, uh, and they run it to completion. Uh, and then, uh, so it won't get interrupted, okay? So it's not like you're gonna get halfway through, then they're gonna go run some other stuff and then they're gonna come back to it, okay? When things get interrupted, then you, you have problems. But in this case, it will run atomically start to finish, 
Now, it is going to jump around, so this goes back to this payable function. Uh, sometimes uh, the, the control uh, or the code that's being run, the control flow as it's called, uh, will, will jump from contract to contract. Um, but anyways, you, you can, it's all deterministic. You can figure out where, what code's going to be run. Okay, so it will never halt kind of halfway through. That said, uh, you could have an error. Okay, so you could run and uh, uh, so there, there could be an error and then you, you might not run to completion because you're going to stop early. Okay, um, so uh, code can abort. And there's usually two cases where it aborts. Either uh, there's an exception thrown so the code itself can throw an exception. So you can say, hey, if you reach this line of code, throw this exception, okay? Or you can write conditions, like uh, we'll see one called require. So you can say require, and then you can put in some logic that has to hold, you know, this integer i is greater than five, and if it's not greater than five, then it will throw an exception, okay? Uh, when an exception is thrown, uh, what will happen is the miner will pretend the code was never run, okay? So the revert, the code. So they'll get halfway through, they'll hit an exception, and then they'll revert the code uh, as if it was never run. Okay. Uh, but what they'll do is they'll keep the gas. So every time they start running a function, uh, they're, they're running little operations, and each of these operations has a price in gas. And so the miner is going to be paid that money for running this function. And if it throws an exception, then that's fine. They still keep the gas because they, they at least ran it halfway uh, before they realized that it was going to throw an exception. Okay. And all the other miners will verify that, yes, they'll go and they'll try and run it too. And they'll say, oh yeah, like uh, when I run it, I get that same exception. Okay. So you'll get a consensus that there actually is a, a that there actually is an exception that's thrown. Um, so that's that's sort of how it, it handles. Uh, the other kind of exception that handle that happens a lot. There's a bunch of different reasons, but I'm just giving you the broad strokes. Uh, is that it actually runs out of gas. So when you run a function, uh, what happens is uh, you estimate your local client will run the function first, and it will say, "Hey, when I run this function, these are the exact operations I follow. This is how much gas it costs me." So what we suggest to you is uh, when you're saying how much gas you're willing to pay to have this function run, you you pay at least this much, okay? Um, and but you should pay a little bit more. So usually what you would do is you would take that number and you might you might say I'll pay up to twice the amount that I think it's going to cost, just in case something changes uh, and it ends up costing more uh, than than you expect. Okay? Why would something change? Well, that's very application specific but it could be that uh, the data structure grows in the meantime, so it becomes bigger and then it becomes more expensive. You know, for example, if you have a list of items and you're trying to find the, you know, trying to find whether something you have is on that list or not, uh, the amount of gas that costs is going to depend on how big that list is. Uh, and so when you run it locally on your computer first to get that estimate, you might have a short list, but by the time you broadcast that uh, to the network, the list might grow and it might actually end up costing more. Okay, so if, if it runs out of gas, uh, what will happen is, uh, well, first off, you, you estimate the amount of gas. And you provide, instead of saying, I'll pay whatever gas this ends up costing, because that might end up costing you a lot of gas, um, you, you basically provide a, a, a bound on the amount. willing to pay, right? So, and then let's say that, so it ends up costing more, uh, then what will happen is the miner will throw an exception. Uh, so it will revert the state, but the miner will keep the gas, okay? So it will run it until you run out of gas, and once you run out of gas, it keeps it, uh, and then it throws an exception, okay? Why does it keep the gas if you don't give it enough? Well, it did have to do the work, and all the other miners on the network are going to have to do the work as well to see that you didn't pledge enough gas. Like the fact that, that this exception is thrown is written into the blockchain. And so that's considered truth. It's truth that you tried to run this function, you pledged this amount of gas, and this amount of gas was not sufficient to run this function. And every miner has to verify those sets of facts. Uh, and that costs them money 
right? Because they have to actually run the code to see that it runs out of gas, okay? So the miner uh, will keep the gas, uh, keep the gas for it, okay? Um, and uh, let me let me put that because I think when we we talked about gas, we didn't uh, maybe specify who it is uh, that receives the gas, but it's the miner, uh, the miner that that b mines uh, the block that has your transaction in it keeps all the gas uh, for that, not just your transaction, but every transaction inside of it. Okay. Uh, the final thing is, we I sort of hinted at this when I said, um, you know, you, you do a transaction, you figure out how much gas it's going to cost, and then when you broadcast it, in between, a bunch of other people are trying to interact with that same contract. So what happens if there's five people, and this is a nice example of it, uh, so we have this set uh, function. So let's say that Alice, Bob, and Carol uh, all broadcast at the same time. Uh, so Alice runs you know the contract dot set and let's say she tries to set it to 50 okay uh, so this is Alice and let's say Bob runs it at the same time as Alice but instead of 50 he wants to uh, I don't know, set it to 17, okay? So let's say that these transactions are simultaneous. Okay, uh, which one will run first? So notice that if they both end up in the same block, what will happen is one of them has to go first. So blocks are ordered in terms of which contract goes first, okay? Uh, so the miner might run Alice's first, set it to 50, then run run Bob, and so immediately right after uh, it gets set back to 17. So it basically is, is never really set at 50, uh, except for in between these two contracts that are being run, but they're both being finalized in the same block, okay? Um, there, now there might be a third transaction like contract.get, and so where you put that get, uh, if, it, if it happens first, second, or third, you'll get a different answer. Uh, depending on, on where, where it happens, okay? Uh, so when you have simultaneous tr transactions, how do you decide? And so the answer is it's just arbitrary. Well, not quite arbitrary, but basically the miner can do whatever they want, okay? So the miner can order any way they want. They tend to order based on whoever pays the most. So if Alice pays a little more for her gas than Bob, uh, then Alice will run first, otherwise Bob will run first. But there's no rule that, that says you have to run things in a certain order. Okay, um, so the ordering is arbitrary. Uh, miners can order however they want. Okay. And so that applies to you yourself. Like say you're trying to do a set of steps and so you do them A, B, C from your computer. That doesn't mean that they'll be actually run A, B, C uh, when it ends up in the blockchain, right? It might get reordered to run C first, then B and then A, okay? And so that becomes uh, sort of problematic where sometimes when you set up your DAP, there are certain steps that are supposed to happen before other steps. And there's nothing in Ethereum that's going to enforce an order, okay? So what you can do is you can add code. You have to add code to your contract in order to make sure that that ordering is enforced, right? So you might have a little variable that, that's called, you know, you might use what's called a state machine uh, where you say, okay, it's in phase one. And then there's here's a set of functions that can be run in phase one. And if you try and run some function that, that can only be run in phase two, then it's going to throw an error. So it's going to check what phase it's in before it, it allows you to run a function or not, right? And then when you run enough of the functions that it's ready to move from phase one to phase two, then you switch it. So you overwrite that variable, now it's in phase two, uh, and then there's a different set of functions that can be run under phase two, okay? So all of that, um, 
that ordering uh, that you that needs to be enforced, you have to enforce it yourself in your Solidity contract. Ethereum's not going to do anything for you. Okay, so you have to write that code in uh, yourself. So we'll we'll talk about an example where you need a kind of state machine uh, uh, that that's related to this fallback function, but that that's going to come a little bit later. Okay. Um, okay. So anyway, so this is it uh, for for functions. Okay. Um, so, so the two functions that you can call are set and get. Another question that we raised last time but we didn't answer is, why would you have a get function? Uh, for example, public, you know, uh, all this blockchain stuff is public, right? Uh, so the fact that stored data stores 35, that's on the blockchain. So I could just go look up what's in stored data in the blockchain itself. Why do I need a get function in order to get that value returned to me? And the answer is that if you're a user that's calling this contract, you don't. You can just go and use your user interface to look and see what's in that what's in that variable. Okay. But if another contract calls this contract, then they might want to do something with the number that's stored there. So they might another contract might say, okay, get me the integer that's currently in this this contract bring it back into its own contract and then do something with that number, okay? So that's why you would still have things like get uh, functions uh, for, for this stuff is, is so that other contracts, you have a hook where other contracts can pull things uh, out of your contract. 